This program was made possible thanks to the generous support of the Northford Group. Remodeling America. I grew up in New England, but had no appreciation for our tremendously diverse wildlife because everybody talked about Costa Rica, Australia, and Africa. Right now, we have some of the greatest wildlife in the world here in North America. And I invite you to join me and my family on this adventure of Expedition New England while we explore the spectacular plant and animal life among us. Not many things can motivate me to get up at four o'clock in the morning. But a chance to dive with blue sharks in the open ocean still does. In what seems like a blink of an eye, we're on the dock with Captain Charlie Donnellan and the crew Neil Cody, Chris Pimley and I are heading out for Blue Sharks. Okay, so guys, we're gonna go to the mud hole today. That's about 18 miles southeast of Point Judith. Okay. And uh, we're gonna go around the dragons. There's gonna be a lot of floaters. That's the bait that comes out of the net or when the, the boat hauls back and they're picking the deck. All the, the small damaged fish, they discard, they throw it overboard. So we're gonna go with these nets here. We're gonna scoop it up, and that's what they call floaters. But you're gonna see giant tuna and sharks. They're coming along and they're eating all the floaters. So we're gonna get free bait, but we're gonna get fresh bait. That's the key. Scuba diving with blue sharks has become an obsession with me. Every year, I get like a fever to go back out there. It's been so long since I've actually caught one. I know with the Japanese economy being down and the Japanese aren't purchasing the fish anymore like they used to, because that was more the older generation. And, you know, I mean, they still do eat the sushi and stuff, but young Japanese would prefer McDonald's burger. Oh, dude, is that the lure making guy? Really? Uh, yeah, it's oh, way works. down. There were, there were fish 20 years ago that paid as high as 35 and $40 a pound when the economy in Japan was good, but it's not like that anymore. And the demand for the fish isn't what it was, so now you could get a dollar or two dollars a pound. Don't you tell know, anybody else about them. There were years ago where it was averaging five, six, eight dollars a pound, but not anymore, not anymore at all. What Charlie is telling us is absolutely true. Our world's oceans are getting fished out. Giant fleets around the world are just decimating. Schools of tuna, cod, pollock, everything in between. And now they're targeting sharks. This is why we're here, folks. Picking up, look at all these fish lying. They're, they're actually, some of them are not even dead, but they are, they're basically have been crushed in the net from the trawlers. Hake and herring. Got one. Got one. All right. Get them in, baby. It's difficult to get your mind around the entire operation here, but we'll try to do it. These dead and dying fish that we're scooping up off the surface have been crushed inside the trawler's net. And when they haul up their catch, they very simply die. And many of the other fish, like tuna, come up, scoop them up. Hence, this is the big attraction here. This is why all these boats are here. They're looking for giant tuna that are trying to eat the dead and dying 
hake and other fish that have been killed in the trawler's net. That's what this is all about. There's mud hake and whiting. The mud hake is a very good eating fish, but it just it goes soft, so you don't find it in the fish markets that often because after three or four days on ice it goes bad. The whiting, that freezes well. That's like a codfish or a flounder. It's a white meat fish, it, and it tastes good, but you have to catch a decent size, and most of the fish we're getting are the small ones that the, the commercial boat is thrown back because they're too small to sell as a table food. All these boats chasing a dream, trying to score giant tuna. Try to pay for a week. As Chris Pimley makes his final attempts at scooping up floaters, the captain finally calls it and we head further south. It's standard procedure. We all have to sign a waiver before entering the water with the sharks. Down is the warm water, works on it. You see the bits and pieces of chump now forming in the well. And it's just a constant chump stick we're gonna be putting out and we won't have to maintain it. Every hour or so, I'll check and just stir a little bit, but the up and down motion of the boat allows water to come in. See, I have two holes in the bottom of my fish well, and so the water pressure as the boat goes up draws water out, and then as we go down on a wave, then it forces water in. It's constantly in and out, in and out, and if you look over the side, you can see the oil situation, and then Hayden oil, and you can see the bits and pieces of the foam. And we put out a nice fragrance for the sharks. And it's like your next door neighbor cooking a steak. You can smell it and you wish you had it, but he's not going to give you any of it. So that's what draws the sharks to the boat as the chum's slick. Uh, it's a scent we're putting out. We don't feed sharks too much. We will throw some fish overboard and allow them to keep their interest. But you don't want to feed a shark because if you give them too much, then they'll fill up and they'll leave us. So we keep the scent out, just keep them interested with bits and pieces of fish occasionally. In the course of a day, we'll probably throw over 20 pounds of fish. With just a few ounces of the magic ingredient, Menhaden oil added to the chum, Chris Pimley decides to jump in the water and snorkel out to the platform where he'll keep watch. Uh, Charlie, just curious, are you still doing uh, any tournaments like shark tournaments or any uh, tuna tournaments anymore? No, I, I haven't fished a tournament in over 20 years uh, because I'm not in favor of killing the fish just to hang it up and weigh it and take a picture of it. If the fish is going to be utilized for eating purposes, that's fine, but to just take the body and throw it in a dumpster, which I've seen, I remember. I remember one tournament, uh, there were over 30 blue sharks caught, and they all went in the dumpster. And that was just a complete waste, so that, that turns me off from tournaments. But, uh, you know, some of the tournaments, they don't allow you to take a blue shark unless it's 300 pounds or other fish, you know. And, uh, but if you're going to take a fish, it should be eaten. And I don't care what kind it is, you can't eat blue sharks, they're horrible, so there's no point in it. If you're going to have a tag and release tournament, well, that's something different. Because now, you, you, you know, you're catching the fish, you're not harming it, and you're releasing it. But when they bring it back to the weigh station, unless it's a make or a thresher that can be eaten, any other shock is going to be wasted. And the beauty with the shark cage diving operation is that we can come out day after day after day and utilize the species of shark, but we're never harming it. Uh, you know, we're not catching it, 
you know, on rod and reel. Uh, we're not killing them. We're strictly photographing. All we, you know, get them up to the boat, and with this hand line, where there's no bait, there's no hook in the bait, but this is used to draw the sharks up from the deep water. Sometimes they'll be 40, 50 feet down, so I'll drop this line down, the sharks will grab it, and I'll pull them up to the surface. But again, they, you know, we're not harming a shark, and, uh, and then we can use it, uh, the fishery tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. It's been about an hour since we ran the chum slick, and so far not a single shark. Well, these fish live in 200 feet of water in the mud hole. They were right down on the bottom. So the pressure that they're under, when they come up in the net, they can't release that, that pressure in the air sac, and that's why they're all bloated like that, because they're all blown up. The air has increased three or four times its normal rate. As a diver, you know every 33 feet, it's an atmospheric pressure. So we've just brought them up from 180 to 200 feet, so you've got approximately five or six atmospheres. And when they can't release the air fast enough, they just, their eyes pop out and their bellies explode like that. And that's why these are the floaters, which we call floaters, they can't get back down. When they come out of the net, they could be fine, but they, they just have so much air inside of them and they can't release it, they can't swim down and they float on the surface, that's how they get the name. After two hours of just sitting and waiting, you finally begin to realize there may be no sharks. And eventually, out of sheer boredom, I had to just suit up and get in the water. Starting to hallucinate yeah. out there. Uh, Start seeing all sorts of octopuses. Um, only thing, only live thing I saw was a little orange fish. And after two and a half hours of waiting for a blue shark, this magnificent comb jelly caught my eye. They feed on the microscopic larvae and rotifers drifting about the Western Atlantic Ocean. This creature is a hermaphrodite, meaning it will produce both eggs and sperm, so it's got no need for dating. Finally, I got a little more adventurous, and against the captain's wishes, I headed about 50 yards down the chum line and encountered another magical surprise. An ocean triggerfish hiding under the sea anchor. This creature, not as much of an oddity as you might think, was caught up in the Gulf Stream down in Florida and now has to live out its final days here in New England waters until ocean temps eventually get too cold and it dies.
tropical fish in New England. We've got to protect our oceans. Stick with us. At this point, we're just about out of hope to see a blue shark. It's been about three hours and nothing. So where have all the blue sharks gone? 20 years ago, at this point, we would have had a dozen big blues in the chum slick by now. How you doing, Neil? In order to get a better understanding of what's happening to the shark, we took a road trip into New York City's famous Chinatown district. I was horrified at what we discovered. Evidence of finning. <laughs> to be blunt, finning is where fishermen deliberately capture sharks, slice off their fins, and discard the helpless creature back to the sea where it'll die a slow, painful death. For many of us in the United States, this may seem hard to believe, but shark fin soup is a highly prized delicacy throughout much of Asia, and it has been for a thousand years. Why? Well, ancient folklore claims that the shark fin contains magical powers in the form of an aphrodisiac. Additionally, sharks do not get cancer, it is thought, so the myth goes that if one eats the shark fin, they too will be spared from getting the deadly disease. Not a single shred of evidence supports this myth, but the traditions are kept alive from one generation to the next. After eating at a purely vegetarian Chinese restaurant, we headed into Chinatown searching for evidence of the shark fin trade. Much to our surprise, we found many other animals on the menu, including two species of turtle. And frogs for sale at the cost of $3.79 a pound. Since the finning of sharks is illegal, you would think it's a no-brainer and the sale of shark fins would be banned here in the United States. But as you're about to see, that's not true. Right here, tucked in between the traditional fish, it looks like spiny dogfish, a species of shark I just recently encountered off Cape Cod. For sale after it's been finned. and at a poultry price of only a dollar a pound. A dead giveaway that something is amiss here. Why would a busy Chinatown fish market bother with selling shark meat at a buck a pound when so many other species of fish like salmon, cod, and tuna bring bigger dollars? It is my belief that these sharks are just on display to justify the fact that they've been finned. This is very painful to watch, especially after swimming freely 
these magnificent creatures off the coast of Cape Cod last August. Sharks are critical to the balance of our oceans. They keep other fish populations in check, weeding out the sick, unhealthy animals while strengthening the gene pool of survivors in our marine world. We've got to protect them and put an end to this senseless destruction. Expedition New England, stick with us. Hi, Daphne Tucker here. Before my dad takes you back out for the conclusion of his 2009 Blue Shark Expedition off Point Judith, Rhode Island, I want to mention a couple of important ideas on how we can all work together to protect the sharks. The first is boycott any restaurant that serves shark fin soup and be sure to call them up and tell the owner you can't support a restaurant that serves shark fin soup. Sooner or later, they'll get the message. Number two, write a letter to your congressman demanding stricter laws to protect sharks from finning. And we need to call on them to push other countries to do the same. Finally, you can support documentary filmmakers dedicated to protecting sharks so we can continue to spread the message around the world. There's a lot to do, so we better get started. Over 100 million sharks are slaughtered each year, all in the name of an aphrodisiac called shark fin soup. At this point, I've all but given up hope. I just want to go home. But Captain Donnellan won't give up. He breaks out a fishing pole and ties a piece of fish bait to a hookless line in an attempt to draw up any sharks that might be down deeper. Finally, it's like a fire drill. Chris Pimley screams, shark, and we're on. Over three hours of waiting finally paid off as a magnificent seven-footer comes cruising through our chum line. Suddenly it turns away from the bits of fish on display by Captain Donnellan and heads right for me. Just a bump. No sign of aggression at all, feeling me out. This is not the man-eater we've been taught to hate. Just a methodical, calculated, intelligent animal looking for food as it prepares for its transatlantic journey across to Africa. And uh, released and then recaptured. And uh, my most notable return would probably be a shark that we tagged uh, in September. And I know it was exactly 102 days later, it was in January, it was recaptured off the coast of Africa. And it traveled 2,700 miles in 102 days. So we know the shark was averaging 27 miles a day. And who's to say that the day I tagged the shark, it left. It could have stuck around a week or two, 
and it could have zigzagged over to Africa, not a straight line, which I'm sure it didn't do. And then how many days was it off the coast of Africa before it was recaptured? So he was probably doing much more than 27 miles a day. And he did that all without GPS, without Loran, without sonar, without radar. So uh, it's amazing that, you know, the, the shark has something bred into it where they're using the magnetic field the Earth is giving off somehow. There's got to be magnetism from the poles or somehow they're navigating and they navigate around the world. Within seconds of turning on my camera, I'm humbled at the beauty of this creature. A pelagic shark most of us would never even know existed because it spends its entire life out in deeper waters way offshore. To think that these creatures are being systematically exterminated from our oceans. It's something I just can't sit back and watch anymore. So I've created this documentary to try to bring to light the plight and the peril of these creatures. So we can all stand up and begin to make a difference and protect sharks from certain extinction. It's up to us. This is New England. Creatures like the blue shark living off the coast of Rhode Island The time is now. We have to stand up all across the globe, no matter what country you're in, and do everything we can to protect the shark. It's imperative to the health of our ocean. To learn more about what we can do to protect the shark, go to our website, expeditionnewengland.com, Thanks for joining us. See you next time. This program was made possible thanks to the generous support of the Northford Group. Remodeling America 